Well, to Paul. Okay. We're going to start out with some quick PowerPoints here. Okay. Smoke and gun stuff. To further drive home the point before I begin reading. Yeah, let's start with this. Susan and I, are we going to start going to conferences again and harassing people? <laughs> well, we better make sure we pay so we don't get escorted out by the sheriff department. Well, that was all bogus. We paid for the pre-conference. We got kicked out of a public bookstore. Mm -hmm. We got escorted out of a public book score, store for asking questions. So anyway, this is this cross conference we went to, Susan and I, and we were asking questions, and I touched on this in the pre-conference. This is a part of my conversation with uh, Anna Wabawile, uh, something like that, BB is what everybody calls him. Point being is, this guy is a big dog in the neo-Protestant movement. I mean, he does conferences with all of the big names, John MacArthur um, included. And uh, Susan and I got into an interesting uh, conversation with his wife on the elevator that really got kind of ugly. Um, <coughs> You didn't, she, know, you didn't know it was his wife at the time. No, we did not. Not at the time. But um, the, the discussion with her was about this conversation. And she was not amused to find out that I knew more about what her husband believed than she did. <laughs> and it wasn't pretty. <laughs> I was glad when the elevator doors opened. Put it that way. So, um, I'm like, which Christ did, I mean... I said, I mean, R.C. Sproul says that Christ actually gained his righteous status by keeping the law perfectly. Would you agree with that, B.B.? Yeah, I would agree with that. Matthew 5, 16. We know Kevin DeYoung was talking about that a little bit, speaking about that. I, uh, I've not come to abolish the law, blah, 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 where they twist that scripture. Okay, and Susan, I'm not going to have time to uh, get into when Susan addressed that with him, but it was really good. <laughs> um, merely blah, blah, blah. Okay, so basically you've got a bunch of reformed godly gook here. Or as a blah, 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 more <laughs> twisting of scriptures. I'm not going to get into that. Paul says there, there that God made him to be wisdom for us, that is our righteousness. Notice how wisdom becomes righteousness, okay? Um, um, or as to say, 1 Corinthians 1 30, 131, where Paul says uh, there that God made him, that is Christ, to be a wisdom for us, that is our righteousness. And that's the Protestant doctrine of Christ for us, okay? Um, in everything, A to Z. Uh, he says, sanctification and holiness. Um, so Christ has become all the holiness. Listen, Christ has become all the holiness we need for justification to be fil fulfilled. So he is, um, the, the reality sounds like, for our justification. All right? So I'm like, yeah, I guess. And by the way, this is all on uh, the website that uh, Andy put up, uh, John Piper's Law Problem. Okay, So I'm like, yeah, I guess, and I understand that angle on it and everything. But then basically, as far as the gospel is concerned, and, and missionaries, I mean, we're there, but it's not us that's really righteous at all. Okay? And he says, well, that's right. That's right. He says it twice. That's right. Okay? So as a Christian, even a Christian missionary, you're not righteous. Okay? 
So I'm like, right, I'm agreeing because I know it's on tape. I just want to get the goods. All right. BB, there's a message that there's a righteousness apart from the law that's by faith from first to last. We're calling other people, listen, to that forest, foreign righteousness that's in Christ. That's Luther. Right. That's uh, Martin Luther's alien righteousness. Paul, right. So basically, in cleaning up our act and going to the mission fields, I mean, that shouldn't be the emphasis, right? I mean, that's what cultures are going to be looking for. They're going to be looking for character and missionaries. Okay. But the gospel is really stating uh, the fact that character is not in us at all. What's he say? Um, yet he says, B.B. says, that Christ is producing it. Okay? It's not us for justification. Well, wait a minute. I thought we were talking about sanctification, right? Uh, yes. Same thing to them. Okay? Paul, right. But it is in us as Christians as we grow with Christ by a particular, and I interrupt him, but, but it's really the one, Christ is really the one that's doing it. When, when you say grow, it's, it's just an increased manifestation of Christ's work, not us. So what I'm really saying is, is hey, come on, let's be honest here. We're talking about Gnostic realm manifestation here, okay? That's why, anyway, so he says, he agrees and gives this answer. By the ordinary means of grace, what's that? Going to church. It's the sacraments. Tithing. I was going to say baptism. Uh, taking right. communion. Right, right. It, the Lord's Table, which is their Protestant version of the Eucharist, okay? Um, he says, so he agrees with me, he's finishing my sentence, and he says, by the ordinary means of grace. Another phrase Sproul would want to use, by the ordinary means of grace, okay? Um, what's happening is, like what Paul says in Colossians, right? Christ in you, the hope of glory. And I'm like, yeah, right. BB. That Christ is, listen, that Christ is manifesting himself more and more. Got it? Look, I'm sorry, folks. Dear, dear church-going Christian, if you don't understand um, the elements and tenets of Gnosticism's realm manifestation, don't tell me you got any clue whatsoever what's going on in church, because you don't. <coughs> okay? Um, so, uh, that is that Christ is manifesting himself more and more, and the normal way that he does that right is by the word, prayer, by fellowship, you know, those ordinary means of grace. That's going to church. Going to church is a sacrament in which you're united to Christ, and Christ is manifesting His works through you, but you're not doing them. And if you believe you're really doing them, you're going to hell, because that is a righteousness of your own. Okay? If you're somebody who's going to church and who doesn't think this isn't the case, then ask yourself, why do you get so bent out of shape when one of your family members doesn't want to go to church anymore? Right. Right. Um, and listen to the language that we hear in church all the time. Mm -hmm. I didn't do it. I, I didn't do it. Okay? It was Jesus. Okay? All right? And you can see the fear in their eyes. Why? Because of the Heidelberg Disputation. If you believe you really did it, you're going to hell. Okay? So it's like, I didn't do it, I didn't do it, and I'm not going to get into 
the centrality of the objective gospel outside of us. But good old Tulian knows that he did, he never performed any good work, so he's good. He's 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 all right. Well, double T bless his heart is the only one that came out in church and just preached this as is from the pulpit and didn't try to nuance it. That's why they had to get rid of him. You know, are you telling me they didn't know about his life and what was going on all those years? Sure they did. But when he stopped being, when he stopped nuancing this, um, they then used that to get rid of him. Okay? That's why I feel so sorry for tool, tooling. My buddy TT, a truth teller. Now, um, uh, that, uh, that Christ is manifesting himself more and more, ordinary means of grace. I'm like, right. Now, please note, please note, in all of this, in all of this, and I, I'm not going to go back and try to find the specific sentences. You may be. But is he not admitting? Is he not admitting in this conversation that the church puts up a front about what it represents to culture? Okay? Is he not admitting that the, the church's advertisement is that come one, come all, going to church will change you for the better as an individual. Okay? A relationship with Christ will make you righteous. You go into any church, to any of these guys, or any pastor, and you say, Hey, as a Christian, do I, go, do I grow in righteousness? Well, sure you do. Well, sure you do. And they know they're lying. They know they're lying. Okay? All right? But it's all nuanced because what they right. really mean is, yeah, you grow in righteousness because... Wink, it's wink, a manifestation. Wink, wink. Right. It's only Christ's righteousness being manifested in you more and more. Right. Right. And that's where they interpret Romans 8, 2 as two realms, okay, and not two laws, by the way. All right, and then we'll read this stuff um, by Burkauer. Uh, Babinet, too, wrote, in connection with the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit, okay, that's not the regeneration of the Spirit, by the way, the regenerate man is no whit different in substance from what he was before his regeneration. Okay? Not a regeneration. Uh, C.J. Mahaney. We are speaking to Christians at a conference. We are enemies of God. We are God-ignoring. We are God-defying. We hate God. Do you know who that is? How can he say that? If that you know, if but that's you know, Luther. You know how offensive that is to someone who is genuinely, who is genuinely loves God and is trying to please Him. Yeah. And then you come out and say, "We hate God." How can you sit there and listen to that? Well, let me tell you something really scary. Let me tell you something really scary. Church has bought into this. Mm -hmm. I know, and I how do you understand how you can sit there and just take that? How well it was slowly assimilated. If he would have got up and said that fifteen years ago in the church, he would have been summarily dismissed. Mm -hmm. But how can he get away with it in two thousand and nine? Yeah. Church has bought into this, folks. They're on board. Okay, they're on board. There's our buddy John Piper. He says, <laughs> We are asking the question, how does the gospel save believers? Any questions? <laughs> Is something ambiguous there that you no don't nuance. understand? There's no nuance there. Okay. Not, 
how does the gospel get people to be believers? Believers need to be saved. <laughs> Any questions? <laughs> Next. Okay. <laughs> The gospel is the instrument of God's power to save us. That's why year after year after year after year, you went to church and you just couldn't figure it out. I, I'm already saved, but every week we're talking about the gospel. <laughs> you know? Why? And the because people are going forward. Mm -hmm. yes. Right. For what? quote prayer or something. The same people go ahead. forward and kneel. Right. Right. Every Sunday. And by the way, in spreading the gospel and what I talked about my talk before last, let me tell you what's gonna be powerful. When they ask us, Well, where do you go to church? <laughs> I don't go to church. You know, what do you mean? No, no, no. Uh, believism, taking up on what Susan said, that's such a great, should we get away from the actual term Christian? Probably. No, no, as a believer, I, I don't do church. That's an institution. Being a believer is being in the, the, the actual family of God. You know what the reaction is going to be? You wait and see. You know, that makes sense to me. Because I've always known something was not right about church. And that's why I don't go. I, I've always known something wasn't exactly right. Wow, now you got their attention. Mm -hmm. You wait. That's what's going to happen. You say that to an unchurched person. Yes. Right. Right. Okay. Let me see. Next. Paul David Tripp. I still have my favorite meme is that one where he's in his get up with his scarf and his and I have on the meme. What husband would let their wife be counseled by this guy? I mean... Someone needs to call him and tell him the 70s wants their mustache back. Right. Uh, here's what he says. We are guilty of sin and alienated from God. This passage says that we are sinners who are guilty and full of shame. Paul uses two powerful words to describe our position before Christ, before God. We are alienated and enemies of God. Sin stains us and separates us from Him. Okay? Next. Yeah, Paul says that in the past tense. Yes. Right, exactly. The, the tense of the passage is completely ignored, and you know how they get away with that? Okay? Uh, yeah, but that's in the past tense. Hello? Oh, no, 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 no. See, all of these passages have to be read in their gospel context, gospel context, i.e. the historical redemptive hermeneutic. You must read your Bible redemptively. Do you know what Rick Holland, the longtime right-hand man of John MacArthur Jr., and, and rumored to be the heir apparent to... Is MacArthur's said, throne. Uh, huh? Is he the one that said good grammar makes bad theology? Yep. Yeah. Good grammar makes bad theology. That's what he said. Okay? And then here's how they'll try to deceive you. But of course we believe in a historical grammatical hermeneutic. Uh, yeah. The use of a grammatical historical hermeneutic to come to a redemptive conclusion. Okay? So, like, uh, historical grammatical is good to going down the path, but at the end of the path, unless you come to a redemptive view, you're going to hell. Because another thing that he says in his book, uh, Paul David Tripp, that is, is that he says this reading your your reading the bible literally removes christ as savior the works of christ as savior because 
if you're interpreting, if and he, he concedes, the Bible does literally say that it's our works. But if you read your Bible that way, you're removing the works of Christ out of the text as Savior. He says that. And um, I was telling this to uh, Don Arms. Okay, and Don Arms is like, when has Tripp ever said that? I said, what is book that you want me to do a review on? And Arms was like, I read that book. I don't remember that. And I took him to the page. And there was just dead silence over the phone. Don, are you still there? You still there, Don? Uh, 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 yeah. Calvin. Secondly, this passage shows that the gratuitous part of the sins is given to us not only once, but it is a benefit perpetually residing in the church. Okay? And daily offered to the faithful. In the meantime, by new sins, we continually separate ourselves. Oops. We continually uh, separate ourselves as far as we can from the grace of God. And the nuance there is the word grace, the w word what has been replaced with grace. Salvation. Salvation. Right, that's what they do. Thus it is that all the saints have need of daily forgiveness of sins, for this alone keeps us in the family of God. Okay? Daily forgiveness of sins found only where? In the church. In the church alone keeps us where? In God's family. In God's family. Got it? All right? Here's a good one, Matt Chandler, Desiring God, 2009. I'm still a wicked sinner in need of the mercy of Christ. In need of the blood of Christ. So he's like, uh, yeah, me, I'm a, even a pastor. I'm a wicked sinner still in the need of the blood of Christ. Again, any questions? In need of the cross of Christ. Is the gospel presentation on Sunday morning for those who are regenerate or unregenerate? I think the answer to that is yes. And that's what we've heard all of our life when, when we're like, um, Pastor, uh, I, I'm, I'm confused about all of this hearing the gospel every week. Okay, you know, what, what about sanctification, blah, blah, blah. And of course the answer is, well, there might be somebody out there that's saved. When they know grade A well that this is why they uh, preach the gospel uh, every Sunday, for that reason right there, what he, what he just said. And this is nothing new with Matt Chandler. This goes back to the very beginning of Protestantism. Okay, and then lastly, good old Michael Horton in the face of God. But to whom are we introducing people to? Christ or to ourselves? Is the good news no longer Christ doing and dying, but our own spirit-filled life? So basically what he's saying is, is the spirit-filled life isn't, you know, is a denial of the gospel. Alright? So, fun facts. Okay? All right. Um, some folks might find that interesting. All right. So, let's look a little bit more at chapter 6. Okay? Um, it is interesting to note that the true gospel that transports us out of the world kingdom into God's kingdom cancels all judgment that condemns. True Christians should not only be controlled, or a true Christian should not be controlled by fear because we are not under judgment. The Bible informs us regarding existing desires which are the quote, the law of sin and death, or the law of the spirit of life. The latter has quote, set us free from fear. That's Romans 8 too 
and allowed us to love aggressively with no fear of condemnation. It is also interesting to note that authentic Protestant orthodoxy in its endeavor to deny the new birth points to fear as a primary and healthy motivator for continuing one's faithfulness to the church to secure their election by God. The so-called Christian who is still under condemnation finds sanction in the church until the judgment day. This is the de uh, definitive church orthodoxy so stated in its creeds and confessions. The kingdom of this world, made up of competing kingdoms, is driven by primarily by control lust necess necessitating authority with caste as its application. The system stands or falls on the total depravity of mankind. The nanny state mentality did not come from nowhere. And the church is just another competing kingdom made up of its own many kingdoms and or denominations in the worldly kingdom morass. As the philosophy author John Emil state notes, church history is defined by political intrigue. Those ex executed for treason are, are relabeled as martyrs, and the pilgrims were political refugee, refugees who came to America to do church state better. Colonial America was a European style church state in the strictest definition of the term. Most of the founding fathers of Americanism grew up under Puritan rule, which did, did more than anything to incite the American Revolution. Okay? So why the Puritans are pointed to is almost the founding fathers of Americanism. They are really what, what drove uh, the, uh, um, drove uh, this to, um, the American Revolution, okay? Um, this brings us to another blatant truth sunning itself in broad daylight. Protestantism was initiated in a church state and for the express purpose of being a church state. Catholicism has never been shy about openly admitting its church state status, and neither was it uh, its stepchild, that is, Protestantism, until Americanism confused the issue. With Protestantism's gleeful contemporary return to its, quote, confessional roots, the church conveniently leaves out its church state legacy. Returning the church to authentic Protestant orthodoxy, which is the present trend, necessarily includes the endorsement of a church state. You can't separate the two. Official Protestant creeds and confessions that Protestantism was founded on in, um, is that a typo? Official Protestant creeds and confessions that Protestantism was founded on, um, yeah, founded on, probably a comma should be there, include specific articles calling for the enforcement of church orthodoxy by the state. Aside from the John Calvin Institutes of the Christian Religion being re uh, written specifically to and for Francis the First, King of France, William Marshall's The Principles of the Westminster Standards Persecuting is most valuable in making this point. The book's inside cover quotes contemporaries of the Reformation to frame the thesis of this book. And I quote from the book, Persecution is the deadly sin of the Reformed churches, that which cools every honest man's zeal uh, for their cause in proportion as the reading becomes more extensive. Regarding this thesis, every Holocaust has had its, its cowardly, cowardly bystanders, bystanders wearing the uniform of the persecutors while raising a safe objection. The following statement by John Owen exemplifies such. He said, I know the usual pretenses for persecution. Quote, such thing as blasphemy. But search the scriptures. Look, as the, look at the definitions of the divines. 
and you will find heresy. And what head of religion uh, soever be in blasphemy very different? To spread such errors will be destructive to souls. So are many things which yet are not punishable with death. Let him who thinks, listen to what he says, let him who thinks so go kill pagans and Mahometans. Such a heresy is a canker, but it is a spiritual one. Let it be prevented by spiritual means. Cutting off men's heads is no proper remedy for it. However, he says, if state physicians think otherwise, I say no more, but I am not of that college. So what's Owen saying? Hey guys, I disagree, but if the church authorities say otherwise, well, I'll just shut up. Okay? Um, and it totally cracks me up about, you know, who is referred to, who wrote the Westminster Convention, the uh, uh, Confession. The Westminster what? <laughs> Divines. Divines. Right. The Westminster Divines. Well, you can't argue with them. Restated another way, I disagree, but if the state agrees with the church, well then, I must bow to their authority. But I disagree. And such will be the commentary of many contemporary Protestants if they ever obtain force from the state which apparently makes the sin sanctified. The fact that there are some good-hearted souls within the denomination, good men can keep their peace while the heads roll, because to label the church as a tyrannical as tyrannical would be a generalization and guilt by association. The ideology is not to blame, only the men who do not see things exactly the way others within the religion see it. As mentioned, you know, the ones that are executing everybody for disagreeing with them. As mentioned earlier in this book, diversity of opinion is used to license any and all absurdities that defy common sense and define evil. In regard to the Scottish reformers, Marshall stated the following. The Protestant reformers in leaving Rome did not leave all Romanism behind them. In particular, they brought with them the persecuting principles of Rome and worked them freely and vigorously in support of the Reformed faith. They changed the Pope, but not the Popenum. And by the way, that first document of the Protestant Reformation that I mentioned, the 97 Theses, Martin Luther concludes that document by saying, you know, be sure of this everybody, but we're not saying anything in this document that disagrees with the Roman Catholic Church. That's what he said in the conclusion of that uh, document. Okay? Um, every now and then I have a little bit of fun on Facebook with these Facebook friends I have that are just beside themselves at, at the compromise going on in the church and especially the hobnobbing with Roman Catholics. And I'm like, hello guys, Luther and Calvin never left the Catholic Church. Why does this surprise you? Here's another one from the book. Rightfully and nobly, that's a repeating of the one originally. Okay, so John Knox, the vaunted Scottish reformer, made it clear that no aberration of reformed doctrine should be tolerated by the state. According to Marshall, Knox, the father of the Scottish Reformation and the presiding genius of it, brought with him to his native country the Geneva Theocracy, and it was copied as closely as the differences between the Swiss Republic and the Scottish monarchy would permit. Such was the church and state system of the Scottish reformers in those days, and hence the melancholy selections from their history which I have now to offer. The first parliament in which the reformers became ascendant was held in 1560. It adopted a Protestant confession, a quote, summary of tenets constituting the essence of the reformed religion. One of the tenets being the theocratic one, 
that note that to kings and rulers it belongs to reform and purify religion. Marshall continued to state that the same confession prohibited the practice of Catholicism or any other aberration of the Reformed Gospel, and such violations would entail confiscating of goods for the first offense, suffering and banishment for the second, and death for the third violation. Okay. Three strikes and you're out. Three strikes and you're out. Marshall then concludes, Thus, the very first legislation of the Scottish reformers was deeply tainted with, with persecution. This is the church history you don't uh, hear about and never have. Marshall continues, The same year, 1561, the first book of discipline was framed by the Committee of the Kirk, which, by the way, the Kirk was a religious court. The Kirk was a religious uh, court in Protestantism from which we get the word church. So part and parcel with the word church is this whole idea of a religious court. I'm sorry, I, I shouldn't chuckle. Of which John Knox was a leading member. Quote, seeing that Christ Jesus is he whom God the Father hath commanded onely to be heard and followed of his sheep, we judge it necessary that his gospel be truly and openly preached in every church and assembly of this realm, and that all doctrine repugnant to the same be utterly repressed as damnable to men's salvation, that the obstinate maintainers and teachers of such abominations ought not to escape the punishment of the civil magistrate. We dare not prescribe unto you what penalties shall be required of such, but this we fear not to affirm, that the one and the other deserve death. Apart from this committee, according to Marshall, Knox stated the following in a public sermon. None provoking the people to adultery ought to be exempted from the punishment of death. That's John Knox. Marshall also included an assessment of how the Scottish reformers took control of the Scottish press. <laughs> Think about this when, when you ask every single church-going Christian out there, what would you think if every congressman and every senator was a church-going Christian and a professing Christian, plus the president. Oh my, that would be wonderful. Don't you know we would have utopia? Okay. Um, this is the quotation from Marshall. Our early reformers claimed a uh, like control over the press. Quote, immediately after the Reformation, the General Assembly took particular notice of the four printing presses then in Scotland, and they were careful that nothing should be published, at least by ministers, till it was communicated to the brethren and revised by persons appointed by them. So they were in total control of the press. Okay? All right? The Westminster Confession itself was, according to its 1647 published cover, quote, and this is on the cover of the Westminster Confession, by authority of Parliament and presented to both houses. The vaunted Westminster Confession that these guys are totally talking about was a government document. All right? Again, the typical sleight of hand used by churches to point to the division it creates to be accountable to no objective truth. Many will quote quickly point out that the Baptist Confession of 1689 ratcheted back the language concerning state enforcement of church orthodoxy, but nevertheless changed nothing because state laws regulating matters of religion were still the norm. Okay, 
And that's what we learned from John last year. What did he say? If you point out stuff like this in the Westminster Confession, what are they going to do? They're going to jump to the London Baptist Confession. Then if you point to the London Baptist Confession, something in there like the fact that it was just a rewrite, okay, and a knockoff of the Westminster Confession with some, with some differences about baptism, then they're going to jump to... Senate of Dort. Senate, yeah, Senate of Dort. You know, uh, and on and on it goes. They just can't. Now, what did John Piper do when I cornered him at the conference? Okay. Um, Calvin isn't my authority. The Bible is my authority. Five minutes after he said, Calvin is my authority. And it's on tape. It's on the video. Okay. Um... In other words, church confessions were not the final word on what was actually lawful. Various toleration movements changed the tone of many confessions, but very few civil or criminal laws until after the American Revolution, which completely dismantled the colonial church state. Nevertheless, in the final analysis, the spirit of church state is still deeply ingrained in the church psyche. <coughs> okay? Susan and I were at a dinner party here in Xenia, which is kind of a religious center of sorts. You got, oh my goodness, how many churches do we have in this town? There's one on every block. Look, look, that's not an exaggeration. Okay. And uh, you got Cedarville University, and this is just kind of, you know, a religious churchian empire of sorts, okay? And we're at um, this dinner party, and people were aghast at finding out that several of the Cedarville professors actually voted for Barack Obama. And I'm like, well, that doesn't surprise me at all. And they're like, why? Well, because there really isn't any difference from Protestant orthodoxy and socialism. There, there's no difference, okay? Um, and then, and then, the one of the same professors they were talking about. The next week, we go visit this church when we hadn't totally given up on church. We thought there was some kind of I don't know sanctified use of it for some reason. And Susan and I are sitting. In this church, we were still dating, actually. We weren't married. We were still dating. And like I said, it's a miracle we got married. She's sitting there, and it sounded very intellectual, okay? And if you didn't know what to look for, it sounded good. And uh, Susan nudges me, and she goes, isn't this good? Isn't this good? It's very thought-provoking for a change. Isn't this good? And I go, it's a Gnostic treatise. It's an in-your-face Gnostic treatise. And I ever, I even said it loud and people were looking around, you know. Um, but then we had a Bible study to where we took a transcript of the, of the sermon and went through it, okay? All right, so you guys watching my time, I got 15 minutes, right? Is that right? More okay. Less. All right. Former governor and presidential candidate Mike Huckabee once said, and I quote, God's law is higher than man's law. Indeed, there is a very fine line between a representative republic and a church state. All that is required is a majority of the legislators who ape Huckabee's mentality. And basically, you got a church state. For all practical purposes, it's a, it's a church state. Why? Because their mentality is, is that, quote, God's law is higher than man's law. Katie, bar the door, because who decides what God's law is? The legislature. What's the difference between that and a church state? Goose egg. Okay? The problem is, God's law is then determined by what the legislators say it means, which brings us back to square one. Authority is truth. As it is, the clear majority of church parishioners think it would be wonderful if every sitting U.S. congressman and senator 
were, a, were professing Christians. This is because church-going, professing Christians think the church is God's preordained representation of his kingdom on earth. Now listen up here. If God's kingdom is on earth, why would Christians not think it wonderful that, that Christians had a majority in the Congress and Senate and the executive branch? If God's kingdom is truly on earth, why wouldn't they want that, right? James Madison, in his memorial and, and remonstrance against religious assessment, 1786, stated the following, And those of you, you who think this is a church nation, now I know the terminology, we're a Christian nation. But see, that's, that's not, no, that's not accurate. The, 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 the statement is really saying, the claim really is, is we're a church nation. Okay? And this is what um, the, the, the framers of the Constitution said about that. He said, James Madison said, because experience witnessed that ecclesiastical establishments, instead of maintaining the purity and efficacy of religion, have had a contrary operation. During almost 15 centuries has the legal establishment of Christianity been on trial. What have been its fruits? More or less in all places, pride and intolerance in the clergy, ignorance and servility in the laity. In both superstition, bigotry, and persecution. Luther was a steroidal, uh, well, bigot, yeah, but superstition on steroids. Okay? And frankly, so was Calvin. Alright? Calvin claimed to see witches flying um, above Geneva. Okay? Because what influence, in fact, have ecclesiastical establishment had on civil society? In some instances, they have been seen to erect a spiritual tyranny on the ruins of civil authority. In many instances, they have been seen upholding the thrones of political tyranny, in other words, like socialism, which is why all these neo-Protestants are Democrats. All right? And in no instance have they been seen as the guardians of the liberties of the people. Never. All right? The idea that God's kingdom is presently on earth, aside from what we just finished observing, creates much confusion among those considering God. While the church scholars wax eloquent about God being all-powerful and sovereign and his kingdom this and his kingdom that, and regarding God being in total control, it begs the question among reasonable thinker, thinkers, where is it? Where is God's power? Where is his control? There is, perhaps, no other idea propagated by the church that alienates people from God more than its kingdom theology. The idea is the root cause of the question, why did God allow you fill in the blank? The doctrine invokes anger towards God and lowers him to just another competitor among earthly sovereigns. Worse yet, God's kingdom does not seem to fare well in respect to the other kingdoms. And apparently, he is a poor judge of men, considering who he has preordained to manage his earthly kingdom over the years. Not only is the vaunted Puritan theocracy out of business, but John Calvin's Geneva, which afforded its citizens few liberties, coupled with harsh sentences that didn't come close to fitting the crimes. Those who disagreed with Calvin were fortunate to escape severe punishments in exchange for merely having their tongues impaled with spikes. Suppose leaders of God's kingdom had a particular intolerance for women who didn't know their place. 
which mania resulted in entire populations of women being wiped out in some European towns. And this was a practice that the Puritans brought with them over the pond as well. Historically, church has always been a hot mess. In contrast, when God truly comes, it is what we would expect from an all-powerful, sovereign God. If God's kingdom was really here on earth, what would it look like? Look in your Bible and see millennial kingdom. Okay? That's what it's going to look like. All right? Um, the present world and its kingdom made up of con uh, competing kingdoms is a hot mess because God's kingdom is not presently on earth. If it were, new and powerful meaning would be attributed to <clears throat> there's a new sheriff in town. <laughs> okay? When God comes to establish his kingdom on earth, it will be a quick and efficient apocalypse that will cause people's hearts to fail and many others begging to be buried, buried alive to hide them from the Lamb's wrath. When Christ reigns in our kingdom from God's throne in Jerusalem, the Bible states that he will rule the world with a rod of iron. That probably refers to a shepherd's staff that was normally made of wood. Justice and fairness will rule, and political correctness will find no refuge anywhere. If the eschatology of God's kingdom is studied, we find a progression of God's restoral. Christ came first to conquer sin, sit, uh, sin. Sickness will be conquered in the millennial kingdom. That's why when God went about proclaiming his um, millennial kingdom, what went along with that? Healing, right? Okay? No. It doesn't mean because Jesus did it along with his preaching about the kingdom, the good news of the kingdom, that, we, that it's for our day. No, it was a proclamation of the future kingdom. And what that part of, the, of, of redemption is. Okay? Um... Not, not redemption of the soul, redemption of overall well-being. First sin is conquered, then uh, sickness will be conquered. But in the millennial kingdom, there will be death, but the Bible says one who is a hundred years will be old will be like an infant. Okay? And death will be conquered in the new heavens and new earth. And we know this because the Bible says that... Um, the last enemy that will be defeated is death. All right? Um, in the Bible, death is referred to as God's, quote, last enemy. And the dominant theme of God's restoral is unity and oneness. This is the contrast between the two kingdoms. Listen. One is predicated on unity and oneness, while the other is predicated on division. One is bent on controlling others through authority, condoned by condemnation and low self-esteem, while the other is bent on mutual submission through love and persuasion. That's the difference. That's the difference between our representation of our kingdom here on earth and the kingdom that's actually here. The church is just another competing kingdom in the world morass of kingdoms, and just another divider accordingly, distinguishes itself as the only worldly kingdom that actually wages war against the Holy Spirit that it claims to love. One of the most dominant themes of the Bible is the following centerpiece, making the Jews and Gentiles one body in Christ through the baptism of the Spirit, the one new man that Andy is going to teach about. Therefore, our kingdom, that is God's kingdom, is future and Jewish. Herein is the crux of election. It involves things predetermined by God that are unchangeable, as opposed to the traditions of men. That's really what election is about. The church makes that fact a matter of individual preselection for salvation or damnation, and then goes about voiding the word of God with its traditions. Israel was elected as God's future kingdom, 
as the world's resident kingdom divider, specializing in instructing the work of the Spirit, the founding fathers of the church set out to do just the opposite, to divide Jew and Gentile and join in with the world for the process of wiping Israel off the face of the earth. So uh, uh, this church kingdom that's supposedly on earth, okay, one of the primary uh, um, objectives of the Holy Spirit is the one new man, right? Joining Jew and Gentile and baptizing them into one spirit, or one man, one new man. What did the church do? It was inherently anti-Semitic, okay? The church can run from this documented history, but it cannot hide from it. And as a consummate divider, using division as an excuse for its rotten feud, fruit, this wasn't just a Catholic thing, it was every bit Protestant as well. A tree is known by its fruit, and no fruit is indicative of an evil tree more than anti-Semitism. The church should be summarily rejected on this fact alone. Two primary theologians of the Roman church, that is the uh, selected epicenter for authority over the ecclesia, um, shortly after the departing of Paul and Peter, emerge and seek to demonize the people of God by making it a strong distinction. Now in this part of the chapter, because I'm wrapping up and we got like one minute of live streaming left, in this part of the chapter, I target three primary ways that the church wages war against the Holy Spirit. Okay? And you're like, that's a shocking accusation, but that's okay. I, I back it up in this chapter, and I think I just did on the one point. What's the second one? What they did with the Word of God. The, the Holy Spirit's second objective is to sanctify its people with the sword of the Spirit. To John 17, 17. Father, sanctify them with truth. Your word is truth. 